they're simply the way that their website is laid out in the morning if you're going through it. One that's quite useful is they usually have a rack, which is an Asia market rack. So when I send the email to you in the morning, you might see that I attach a couple of articles. One of them is the Bloomberg rack, where it just basically gives you a uh, summary what happened at the close of Wall Street, what's happened in China, what's happened in like anything major in Australia, New Zealand, India, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is normally only about a four minute read, and you've pretty much got an overview of what's going on. Uh, so it's quite useful. Um, the way in which they present their news on their website is basically a hierarchy of what they're deeming is the most important and the most read by hits. So typically you get the main headline. So when I look at their website, I basically just skim headlines of what or anything that's interesting to the products in which you're trading. So when I look at this, German prosecutors probe market manipulation wild wirecard reports. I mean, from the products that we're trading, I'm not bothered, so I, I don't look at it. Here, opinion, not bothered. Fraud allegations for Wirecard, again, not bothered. Free money didn't help people find jobs, Finland says, I don't care. So actually, all I'm doing is a process of elimination. Um, granted, I've had many years of training of kind of making quite quick decisions, but literally all I do is when I scan over all of these headlines, I ask myself just a baseline question, is this going to move markets or not? Yes or no? Now, when I was new, then maybe yeah. And my pile of yeses was probably about this big. Uh, the benefit that I had is that I actually sat on a trading floor and I would squawk, 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 squawk on the mic. And I used to get shoes, pay for airplanes, lunches, whatever thrown at me. So I quickly got to know how much I should be speaking and how much actually is relevant. Combination of that and also the better I got at knowing who the companies are, who the central bankers are, who the choke points are, who the oil producers are, the better selective I got of knowing whether or not it's important or not. So it did come with a bit of time with all the, the background work that, that came. So again, everything you do, German finance minister signals support for national champion banks, not important. So you quite quickly get to the point where you can look over websites like this and you scan down, and realistically, it takes in the morning, following that one simple rule, two minutes maximum to look at the Bloomberg entire homepage of their main stories. Now, one thing I definitely do do here is that if I see something that kind of sparks my interest and I go, hmm, that's interesting, I definitely do bookmark it, or, because I'm fairly old school, I print it out and I keep a stack of articles that then I'll read when I have time at the weekend. They're not relevant to my trading right there. Yep. There's one on the right hand side. Oh, yeah. That would be interesting. There, the hedge fund bond trade that keeps on giving. Is that the kind of thing you would? So here, it's in their opinion section. So, I mean, this is really interesting at the moment because basically the Italians have met up with the, the heads of the yellow jacket protesters, which is obviously a massive two fingers to Macron, and they're a populist government in Italy, and France is about to burst at the seams. This is the last thing that Macron needs. So all this stuff actually is really interesting, and the opinion of how the outcome of these relationships is quite key. Would I look at this uh, that morning? No, not unless I had time. Otherwise, to be efficient for just getting to the point of what are the fundamental things that are happening do I need to be aware of? If there was a major key meeting happening between Macron and the two parties, the League and the Five Star, that day, then probably I would read it, because I would need to be absolutely on point with where are we at the moment, in terms of the dialogue and the context. Um, so yeah, opinion, this would be a classic weekend section, where you would print stuff out and you would just read it at the weekend. So. Uh, I think I said this to one of the guys earlier, there's a real difference here between Monday to Friday, what's actionable information that you can use to trade or make a more informed decision, and then the weekend, which is how do I improve my macro view, how do I spend a bit of time reading a bit more about something I don't quite understand, all those <coughs> things. So it's kind of divided quite, quite
quite clearly in that sense. The only other area on the website in the morning that's quite useful, if you go to the menu, the markets, second tab, this is a lot, a lot more focused than really for things that are more likely are relevant for you. Um, on the left hand side, they have the latest stories that are coming out. So in the morning, how these news agencies work, Bloomberg, if I was a journalist at Bloomberg, I basically get to work at about six, um, and then I start publishing at half past six. Because copy needs to go out on the website and the terminal ahead of the futures open at seven. So one thing is there's no point looking at the news at four o'clock in the morning. It really isn't much point. Um, now and again, you might get an exclusive comment from something overnight, but more often or not, the journalists are not in yet. How Bloomberg uh, operate, they have a major office here in London, which is not too far from here, and then they've got a major office in New York. Otherwise, in the Asia-Pacific region, it's all satellite offices, Singapore, Hong Kong, wherever it might be. So actually, the volume of news, all of a sudden, if you sit there at 6.30, loads of stories start coming out. So there's no point looking at four, because nothing's there yet for that day. So just to give you a, a heads up with that. Go through here, and again, I just skim through. Is there anything here um, that's relevant? This is quite useful. Five things I need to know to start your day. Um, this was, like, well, let's click on it and have a look. So, daily post. This is a daily post that goes up 6 a.m. I think every morning, 6.30. Uh, trade wars. Uh, this is talking about Jeff Bezos, obviously it's come out. And, I don't know what he's done, how he's wheeling out and got photographed or something like that. It's all the press. Um, and then, yeah, other key things that are happening. Short read, just getting out to speed of some of the key events can be quite useful. Uh, again, I'm showing you all of this. I'll circle this back to the shortcut. But this is what you can do if you've got plenty of time in the morning. So that's, that's it for Bloomberg. Um, to give you an idea, when I'm going through it to check things in the morning, I don't spend any more than five minutes looking at it. Um, don't get me wrong you guys, that will probably start at about 20 minutes. And then because you won't feel as confident at just making that assumption of no or yes, it is going to move markets. With Reuters, definitely you've got to look at Reuters. You might say why, because effectively they're reporting on the same news. Should surely you get everything that you need. Don't forget, different news agencies are trying to keep a competitive edge. So by default, they'll have exclusive content, exclusive interviews, and these are the types of things you're looking for. Um, here on Reuters, on the home page, first thing I look at is the wire on the left hand side. This is basically their delayed feed of what people who are paying are getting on the terminal system. So this quite literally is every major story that's coming out. Four minutes ago, five minutes ago, six minutes ago. Now in the morning, obviously this is, I go back to about 6am and I just look from 6 to 7 what the news is at that point when I get in. Um, most of the news, again, 95% is irrelevant, but every now and again, they'll have an exclusive comment from a Federal Reserve member, Reuters interview. And so, I'm aware of it then, and I can see what the context is. Um, I just hit load more, and I can see all the headlines. The other sector, or the other parts of the website, business, business home, and here, I just revert back to that skimming of headlines, is there anything important? Now at this point, most of the content is re repetitive from Bloomberg. So your checking is quite quick on here. <coughs> so like this sort of thing, explainer. So these are actually, Reuters do these quite well. They basically take a subject and do it line by line. What needs to happen legally for the due court like process. They'll have explainers and something called fact box which basically gives you all the facts behind quite complicated things, but by numbers, that can be very useful. But here, how will, how will finance work if there's a no-deal Brexit? Again, interesting, I probably would like to read that. I'm not gonna read it in the morning, at six, uh, seven in the morning. This is something for later. Um, the beauty, of course, when you're, when you're trading, is if you just bookmark these things, typically, most of the day, you're not in a trade. You've already got a strategy plan, you're just waiting for the price point so you can execute. And that's when you can, if you're an activist like Will, 
that's when you can distract yourself and be a bit efficient and do some learning instead of sitting there being teased by the devil trying to tempt you into clicking buttons when you know you shouldn't, basically. So these are ways and means of using your time efficiently. Um, I take it for news that was going to break, you would never go back to this website, you'd use that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go through that in a second. But yeah, Twitter is breaking news, never from these websites. It's only in the morning, really, when it is useful. Uh, the other section is markets, markets home. And again, I just skim, skim the headlines. So here, you know, you get like an exclusive source. US considers withdrawal of zero tariffs for India, but the problem is it's not really relevant because it's India. But it's an exclusive and it's a source, so it's only Reuters content. So from time to time, you will see stuff like that. Um, the other one that's good, and it's good for a different purpose, is the FT. I would say that if you're going to trade regularly or invest in the financial market, this is just the cost of doing business in terms of paying for a subscription. You just need to pay your 20 pounds or whatever for a digital subscription. You should have it. Um, because what you get with the FT is very different. Now they do have what's called like a, um, a speed news desk, which is keeping on top of breaking news. You're releasing it very quickly. But they have a very small team, literally handful, and it's called the Fast FT. These are journalists who literally sit there, um, probably not logged in, so we won't be able to get into it, but they have this feed which updates quite regularly where they'll post on anything and everything that's moving markets. So it could be a company, it could be a political situation, it could be economic data. The good thing about this, and this actually has a permanent space on my screen, because if I'm away from my desk, let's say for an hour, or like with you guys now, I'll go back, and actually by just skimming these headlines, I'm pretty much right up to speed with everything that's going on. Nothing that, that goes unnoticed then. And the good thing about this is when you click show more, these are only, usually on average, I'd say, about 300 words long. So basically it's a paragraph. So it's a short form journalism that's meant for speed. And often, what comprises a lot of the content is the guy at the FT is called the guy at JP Morgan, and the guy at JP Morgan has gone, this is what I think, and he's just published a comment. So it's quite good for getting that bank insight, that herd view on situations as they're developing. So again, it helps with that process of watching Bloomberg TV, listening to what these banks are saying. So the Fast FT is, is very good for that. Otherwise, what the FT is good for, Bloomberg specializes in purely breaking news. They, their, their opinion pieces are limited, let's say. But what they do have, they're very efficient at breaking fast financial news. That's what they're in the business of doing. FT journalism is slightly different in a sense that the depth of analysis, opinion, it's a bit more considered, it's a bit more uh, thought-provoking in that sense. This will help with your learning. Not so much to push the trigger and trade, that's where the news, you're reacting to the Bloomberg news. But this is where, well how do I get to the point of making a decision of what's important to trade? This is where you're going to get that kind of underlying awareness and knowledge from. Um, with the FT, literally I apply the same process over the headlines. With all of these websites, the lower you go, the less, less relevant it is. Literally, with the FT and Bloomberg, all of them, once you scroll down to about here, all the rest is junk. Um, you know, you start getting to like careers, you start getting to like how do you spend your money, and all this sort of stuff, it's irrelevant. <coughs> I do go through world, UK companies and markets as the tabs, and I just literally do the same thing. I'm just having a look, what's going on, anything interesting. If you've got the app, you can do that on your way in to be um, more efficient with your time. Now, that's the major press. What you guys will have access to uh, is Trading Live. So, tradinglive.com is basically our portal as for a couple of different things. One is, 
I can watch what Sam is saying. So let's have a look. Pocket before we, we get to that point, for me, it, it, it's right. good, it makes sense, and a stop just below the S1, I believe, at the time. So, yeah, good risk reward, good trade, good patience. Yeah, I like that one. I think it's a, you know, a, a really, really nice. So, so he's doing that live now. So whilst you guys, let's say, next week are here, doing your own thing with the guys, he and I will, will be delivering this type of thing throughout the day anyway. So here, what he does uh, routinely through the day, uh, these aren't necessarily his trades. He will keep people anonymous, and he'll talk about other people's trades, what was good about them, what was bad about them. He will talk about his own trades that he's doing, because unlike me, where you know, my chief role is is being on the mic explaining these things and also running Amplify, he's trading day to day actively and he will talk about it. Um, the one thing that the guys in say stage three find the most beneficial is almost him identifying the wrong and right reasons and how he would have approached them and kind of making it a bit more real of what it is that you guys are doing. Does um, he, does he um, put a live trade on that he's putting on? Is it always historic, something that's already gone on? Whilst he's in a trade, We'll talk about it as well as post reviewing it as well. Uh, to give you an idea, Sam is, I guess, on the balance, relatively conservative. Um, he has, as I said before, quite a high reliance on technicals, so unless the market's at his price, he's not trading. Um, that's what he's good at. Like, he won't trade unless it hits his price, which is probably the great skill that he has. So he'll probably trade anything on average about three to five times a day possibly across, all, across the different uh, products that are available. Uh, depends on what's going on on that given, given point. But here, this definitely is not his trade. I already know from the behavior of the trade. Because here, there's just too much going on. There's a, lack of dis there's a lack of patience for this trade. They're kind of going in and out, in and out. They're not holding it with any type of conviction. Uh, this looks a little better. Uh, although the entry looks suspect because it doesn't really have any technical relevance, they're looking a bit too short to firm off that previous high to get in. I would have preferred maybe here to get in, or like Sam's got here, if you're looking at that trend line as the, the trigger to get in, and then he's scaled out of the position at the previous high, and then he's actually added to the position. So if you look at it, he's gone in on the trend line here, whoever this is, they booked the profit just ahead of the target, which was the previous day's high. The market's gone through that run on the previous high. It's come back down. They've taken the classic. They've then gone long, booked the profit again, just ahead of the respective R1 on the day. And then, yeah, then it's got a little bit messy just at the end. Um, so, you know, these are all, you know, the trades that the guys in stage three are doing at the moment. But even though all of you will trade quite differently, it's really quite good to see the mistakes <coughs> of what each other make and the good things. You learn much quicker in that respect. We're all very open in that, in that respect. Yeah, it's not a case of we'll only show you whatever is a good trade or a, a winning trade. Um, so yeah, you've got that on the chat room here. What you've also got is the live score. So, here, you get all of the headlines that are coming out that supplement the audio squawk. The squawk is always the first um, point of delivery. As soon as they see it, they say it, you get things with a little bit of lag. Um, so in the morning, if you scroll back down to your headlines, so let's go all the way back. So here we go. So at 6.14 in the morning, these guys produce a wrap-up of everything that's happened from the close on Wall Street, overnight in Asia, and the main headline of every other newswire. Mine's the news. So you've got the main headlines. So if you're being really advanced, all you really need to know is the bullets, because then you're pretty much ready to go. You know everything that's happened. A little bit more content, or well, how did Asia perform? Geographically, any key things happening in Hong Kong, China, the major regions. Major headlines in the UK and Europe, FX, commodities, geopolitics, US, done. That's it. You read that, then you're already up to speed. 
and that will be available for you guys Monday to Friday at 6 15 every morning so that's that's what you should do beyond our doors first morning mm -hmm. call as part of your routine okay? don't start looking at charts visualizing trades going oh I could get long here do this first then start looking at charts so then you've got the two different things to formulate the most cohesive, fundamental and technical view on the market as it is at that point. Yeah. Now, one thing you can do is, if you haven't, I think it's only available on iPhone, I'm afraid. Um, if you search Brand Squawk, uh, so what, on, uh, the on the App Store, um, on the um, what do they call it? It's a podcast. So you need to go to the Apple uh, pod, uh, podcast app, not iTunes, the actual podcast app. Search Ransquark. And basically, what they give Apple you podcasts. is the guys who write that piece that I just showed you, they have a free podcast where they audio format, read through that little segment. So, see. <coughs> right. So that is a three-minute soundbite, and it down. If you subscribe to it for free, you just get the podcast delivered to you your phone at quarter past seven every morning. So on your way in, you don't even need to look at that website or the headlines or go back. You can just listen. Um, the reason I do my briefing for 20 minutes or 30 minutes is because my objective is different. I need to explain to you why I'm looking at this piece of news, what the background is, my opinion about it, what I think about it. When you guys get much more competent, this should suffice then. Because then it's just about, and just tell me the news. Save the opinion, please. That's, you know, in a few years' time, that's where you guys will be at, hopefully. And then every now and again, you'll ask me for something, but you'll be self-sufficient. And I think that's a good goal, because ultimately, you guys want to be doing this for yourself in the long term. If you listen to this in three minutes in the morning, as of next week, and you, you finish three minutes, and you go, like, what does this mean? Like, I've got no idea whether I want to be long or short. That's exactly where you should be at this point in terms of don't panic. That's then my job at half past eight to go, this is why. They just read the news. I explain it at that point. At the end of nine weeks, hopefully, everything I say in the briefing, you should be already thinking the same types of things from a fundamental perspective. That's the goal, let's say, as where you want to get to. Um, who knows, I might pull, pull one of you on for a, a morning guest appearance. Give a little a little run on the mic. Yep. So on the podcast site, you literally just subscribe to it then? Yep. It? Subscribe to it. It should automatically download, I think. Every morning, it will be there at quarter past seven. And then on your way in, on the bus or the train or whatever it is, just hit it three minutes and you're, you're good to go. So rather than go through Bloomberg, Reuters, again, that Collectively, that will probably take you, when you're new, a good 45 minutes. It's not letting you download the yeah. Apple podcast, it's just saying open. If, you, if it says open now, the app is probably downloaded, or the, now you press the open. Does that work? I'll get into it, and then I can search um, Ranswall. <coughs> yeah. yeah. It shouldn't be. Well, it wasn't the last time I... I must admit, I don't. I recommend everyone gets Twitter, irrespective of whether or not you want to use it for, for having it up in your screen to put information. Because you know, having it on your phone, top of news, to be, again, making use of your time going to and from office or meetings, wherever it might be, is a really good short way of keeping on top of the latest news and rumors. <coughs> now, first thing I would do, once you get your account set up, is go onto my account, go to who I follow, 
follower. Um, my, if you just type my name, I think I come up as the first person. <coughs> and then go to my following. You won't be able to do all of this now because it's going to take you a good 10 minutes or so. Um, but then literally follow everyone I follow. That will give you a nice starting point as to a good overall global macro view of what's going on right now. Um, as you can see here, it's a combination of, well, really it's quite politically focused at the moment. So Katia Adler, she breaks a lot of the Brexit news on the European side. Uh, Tom Newton Dunn, you might have heard of, he's the political editor of The Sun, so he gets good exclusive content. Deputy political editor of The Telegraph, so on and so forth. So rather than just authenticated stories that journalists are writing that are coming out on the FT or Bloomberg, these guys are the ones where you get the rumors and the hearsay and the quick shorthand, what did Theresa May just say when she exited the meeting? This is where I get that kind of content from. Um, there's other, other people, like there's traders or other analysts that say useful things, but everyone on here, barring Andy Murray, is relevant for the feed that you need in order to stay on top of the news. Now, a couple things to be aware of when you are looking for people to follow, let's say, a couple of basic rules. One, I'm not verified. Um, to get verified, I just need to send application papers to Twitter verifying that it is, in fact, genuinely me. You don't need to be a certain level of followers. Every one of you, even with one follower, could apply to get verified. Um, so verification often is a good sign of whether it's an authentic account. The following to followers ratio. So basically what you're trying to ascertain is how much of an influencer is this person. So typically the people who, um, that, like Faisal Islam, who you probably recognize him from the political correspondent of Sky News, used to be Sky. Well, he's BBC now, he used to be Sky. Um, so for him, well, let's have a look. He probably follows quite a lot, though, I'd imagine. He might be a bad example. Right, so he's got 9,000 following, 300,000 followers. So this is quite a classic sign of it is Pfizer Wisner. It's a genuine account. It's definitely his content. He's also verified uh, in that respect. So... These are the kind of routine checks that you'd go, go through just to make sure that you are in fact following the right, um, the right people. Because you do sometimes get fraudulent accounts posing as other people who basically are traders looking to manipulate the market. Yeah, traders will go to funny extent to try and get out of positions. Is that account a fraud or is it just fake news? It's fake news, mm. yeah. For, for not unless you made a ridiculous amount of money, then probably the authorities would want to make a point of you. But yeah, in a sense, you could. There's nothing stopping you doing it. Um, the other thing that I would check whenever I'm looking at someone who's worthy or not following is the type of content that they're posting. There's no point, I don't, I don't know if I said this to you guys or, or the previous group, there's no point following Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is one of the major investors in our market. Absolute great guy, great investment techniques, a good fund manager, zero relevance for us to follow. Why? He opened a Twitter account and he's tweeted on nothing relevant ever. And he hardly ever tweets because he's about 150 years old. So it's not exactly his form or medium of how he communicates. So remember, you don't want to follow people who are not offering you up any <coughs> relevant you know, value. Um, when you, whenever I look at someone, I also go through and I look at well, how often do they tweet. It doesn't matter if it's the best person ever and they're really insightful. If they never actually communicate, well, there's no point in being there. Again, they're not offering you any value. Um, so that these are the things where you kind of build this up over time. To give you an idea, this will give you a really great global macro oversight. Um, but yeah. I do have 14 other accounts, not in my name, following different types of things. Um, but this should be a good starting point for you. 
to get to that point. Yep. Is there a way you can um, set it to the latest week's coverage? Right. So this is this is where we're getting to. Yeah. Because <coughs> this is the let's say the system. The actual product we use though to stream the tweets is something different, uh, which I'll which I'll show you now. So one final thing on here. So let's say I go to who Anthony myself is following, and I go, okay, Beth Rigby, deputy political editor of Sky News. Okay, she follows quite a few, but okay, she follows 1,800 people. What I do is I'll go, okay, so who does she follow? Because who's who's good enough to fit her hot list? She's she's found someone quite senior. Well, you've got to be someone pretty important then to hit her list. Okay, so who's on her list? Joan O'Leary. Joan O'Leary, obviously, best buddies. <coughs> but what we do here then is you can, if you wanted to, spend some time going through the influential people's list. <coughs> so if we look at what I mean is take the most famous political correspondent in our country, Brexit, is undoubtedly Laura Coonsberg. She breaks almost everything. Um, there definitely is a quite distinct and clear hierarchy of the journalists who have the ear of the people of power. And she only follows about 1,400. I definitely go through, well, who, who are these people? So say like Stephen Swinford, he's a deputy political editor of the Telegraph. So he's actually quite punchy. So if I click on him, he's going to have a lot of people following him already. Rob Powell, never heard of the guy. Westminster political reporter for Sky News. So he is now, look, former BBC South. So he's, I mean, he looks about 15, so he's probably quite new. The point being is, he's a lot more low-hanging fruit. Therefore, actually, probably not many people follow him. But think about Laura Koonsberg follows him. So what does this group know? So she, she would know and yeah. would emerge. Right, so for me, that's exactly how my mind starts working. And I start going, okay, so I click on the seed tweet about how often is the seed tweet? What's the quality? When did he break the news? Okay. <coughs> yeah. So that's the, how you start to develop this if you wanted to. Like, if I was doing my old job, I would take Rob, given he's young, I'd give him the best night of his night out in the West End, and he would be singing like a canary the next day. <coughs> that's how the world works in, in reality. So. The, root, the system we use then is called Tweet, tweet Deck. Now, this is to, for your <coughs> question about how do we get the tweets to scroll. So, Tweet Deck is owned by Twitter. So, if you go to tweetdeck.com, you just log in with your Twitter credentials. They're owned by the same company. Now, let me just go through a couple of things. When it, it's going to look something like this. But all you do, go up to the top, so this like setting <laughs> icon here, click on it, and click remove. Click, remove. So basically what you're doing, this is my setup I have on my screens at the office. But I'm just making it completely blank so we can talk it through and we'll build one together ourselves now. So remove, click, remove. So now you've just got a blank canvas to build your feed on. Now, see your little icon, this is you logged in. You go to the plus, add column. You click on home, it will bring up your Twitter account. Now, so here, myself, I click on myself. I hit add column down here, the bottom right, I close that window, now I've got one feed. This is the feed now of the 238 odd people I follow on my official account. Now the difference with TweetDeck is a very, very simple idea. All it does is that whenever any one of the 238 tweet, it instantaneously appears on my feed. Now, where this actually is used a lot is whenever I've gone onto national newspaper floors, journalist floors, they're monitoring news because they want to capture 
something happening in the world before everyone else starts talking about it. So that's where the product has come into balance. But for us, there you go, see that tweet come down? It just bumps the list down. So basically, depending on who I follow, I can create a highly curated feed that's specifically relevant on a subject what I'm looking at. Um, I heard a couple of guys talking earlier when I came in about that footballer that died and what happened. I actually know nothing about that. Because in my little world of news bubble, I'm totally, I've created feeds where I don't get that stuff because it's absolutely of no relevance to me and what I'm doing. So actually my knowledge of like popular culture is fairly limited because all of my channels of information are absolutely drilled down for only what I need. That's why I know a lot about markets, not a lot about Little Mix or wherever, whatever's popular these days. Now, a couple of things. One, you only ever need to use the one column, in my opinion. Because you are using this for two reasons. One, actually, as we said earlier, you're not in a trade 95% of the time. What I would suggest you do then is in this situation, you have your window, something like this, on your desktop, or this does work on an iPad, so you don't have to take up any of your screen space, and you just have it as a column where all of a sudden, subconsciously, it's very difficult to not know what's going on on this planet that's relevant for markets. Because all of the time, you're getting relevant, specific information all of the time. So I don't sit there, like I said, I don't sit there reading. It's because I'm just perceptive and I pick up on things as I'm saying it. So when I do a morning briefing and I start throwing out dates or stats, a lot of the time I don't even know where it comes from. It just comes from me having observed it here at some point. Now that's one thing that you can do. Other functionality on here that's quite useful, if you go to plus and you've got one called user, so say if uh, we just said Laura Koonsberg is very important, you can in fact search for her. Well, she doesn't come up under Laura. Well, let's take uh, just any person. Let's take this person. So basically, you can add them to your columns, and it could just be Laura Koonsberg specifically, or Donald Trump, for example. The risk is that if you followed. 2,000 people on your Twitter account, can you imagine how fast this is moving? Absolutely. But you're going to miss it. So in order to counteract that, you could have a Trump-specific column if you wanted to. I would say the maximum number for you guys to follow in one Twitter account or one column is 400. Yeah? Um, if you go up north of that and up to 1,000, it will be more of a distraction than anything else because it will take too much brain power to monitor and focus. So that's user. If you go back to plus, the other thing that can be quite useful, not that I think that you guys will need to use it too much, is the search function. Now, how this was very useful for me in the past is that when we had the EU referendum, if you remember, there's 650 constituents, all of which will report results of the exact two ballot total of each area, and then it was just accumulation of votes to determine where we were at, whether in or out. So for me, all I did was backtest every historical voting event, looked at a chronological assessment of time, as to get an order of when these were going to be released, and then overlaid a geographic study of the population of each area. Quite simple, actually, when you start thinking about it, to approach it. So all of a sudden, rather than being the guy at home going, it's a bit of news, I've traded it. Oh, it's moving down, I've traded it. I had an absolute specific list of 650 identified into key 50 areas of which the first one is always going to be most impactful. Why? Because markets already jumped to conclusions, as you know, very early about future outcomes. So when Sunderland came out at 12, on a search facility, I've already got Sunderland plugged in, then Newcastle East, Newcastle South, and all the ones that I know are coming at that point in time. And then what I'm hoping for, what I'm positioning myself for, is the kid 
who's carrying the box, who's being paid as a part-time employee to carry the box to the stage for the lady to say the announcement, so happens to tweet it because he's so excited and he's 16 years old. I see it and I know the announcement one minute before everyone else does. I kid you not, this type of thing happens more often than you think. Yeah, so that's why you guys would pay someone like me because it takes a lot of obviously watching to get this type of advantage. Um, so this can be very good. So the, the US election was the same. If you think about it, there's no point, zero point, worrying about California in a presidential election. Why? Well, it's only going to vote one way. So who cares? What is important in a, in, a, in a general election type of event is the swing states. And where are the swing states in America? They're predominantly East Coast. So then you've got a, ge you've got a geographic consideration of time. By the time California comes out, you already know the result. Why? Because the East Coast has got all the numbers. So all you do here is you plot out Pennsylvania, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, and you just find out where the times are, and then I'm looking for the time arbitrage of getting news before Bloomberg gets. So actually, the guys on Squawk, if they're doing their job right, they're doing this, which is why you start to see the real value in having a team of people doing that. Yeah. Very difficult for you to do that and trade. Actually, it's impossible. Because one, it's not going to be done right because it hasn't got your full attention. Yeah, so that's why you have a score. But that's what the search function is quite useful for. For anyone who ever trades energy and specifically oil in the future, there's only one hashtag in the finance world and it's specific for oil. It's this one. So it's hashtag OOTT. And essentially, it stands for something. It's irrelevant what it stands for, but it's the online organization of, of tweeting traders. What this is, though, is it's two former, or well, one's an analyst, I think, one's a trader. They started this hashtag that has now been adopted by the entire industry as whenever anyone worth their salt says anything on energy, they finish it with the hashtag OOTT. And so actually, this then is not the people you're following. Don't forget this is a search filter. What it is, is every single person on planet Earth tweeting that has that hashtag, you'll see it. So it's quite good for staying on top. And then the other thing this is very good for, which will happen if you trade intraday fairly regularly, which is there's been an evacuation of the shard, or London Liverpool Street evacuation, suspect bomb. It happens all of the time, actually, when you monitor this type of news. Now, I need to know what's going on immediately here. So it can be quite useful to get literally people on the scene you know, putting photos, things like that. When it comes to terror alerts, um, because terror is so priced in, it hardly ever moves the market, but you don't know that definitively when the, when the event is unfolding, because it could escalate. So at that point, such as now human behavior, you actually take advantage of by using this type of system. Because most people don't help, they take photos, or they video it live. And as long as I can have access to that, I can actually see it happening. Yeah. So that guy, what was that guy here? Um, Tulse Hill the other night, the guy with the machete, did you read about that? Yeah. I was on that train, I was stood four feet away from him, and he had the machete in front of me. Yeah. I was actually on that train. He got tasered, didn't he? Yeah, he got tasered. Yeah. Like, I'm not kidding, right in front of me. Yeah. I was on the commuter train going home, and looking around everyone, because people were going up, he went up the stairs to the other platform, and so some people were coming up because they came on the platform, and I opened the door to say, don't go up there, the guy with a massive sword. And then everyone on the train was barking at me, going, shut the door, shut the door, because they were scared, they were so scared. But then I looked around, and everyone's on their phone, just filming it. <laughs> like, I'm like, has anyone called the police? <laughs> and they're just filming it. And my wife had our baby, and I was like, it was just absolutely, it was really quite, quite frightening at the time. Because then they, you know, he was just, he was obviously just a, a mentally ill man. But 
But the point being is that people film this stuff. And think about it, how quick did the police respond? Well, do you know what? One thing to be said for the police, as much as we all might have, they absolutely, guys ran, ran into him and solved that situation. Hats off to them. But the point being is it takes at least three or four minutes for the police. It takes at least eight to 10 minutes for the news to pick up, to pick up on the social feeds that, that what's going on. So if you think about it, you are anything from five to 10 minutes behind the curve from an information point of view. Now just imagine if you've got a massive T-note position in the market and you're short T-notes and all of a sudden there's reports of some coordinated global terror attack and it's unfolding in central London.